Welcome, I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Letter to the Hebrews, an explanation of the mechanism of our salvation. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 9, which covers the Letter to the Hebrews, Chapter 8. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary and the true tent which is set up not by man, but by the Lord. So in our previous lessons, we've been building to the point that Jesus is a different kind of high priest. Uh, one in the order of Melchizedek, rather than in the order of the Levitical priesthood, uh, who nonetheless offers sacrifices. And here we see something then about where is he doing all of this? We start to talk about the sanctuary and the tent in which Jesus serves versus the sanctuary and the tent in which the Levitical priesthood serves. Uh, Jesus serves on the throne, the implication being in heaven, uh, as opposed to the others. So, what a great deal. We have a high priest who's actually there in heaven, able to intercede for us. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, hence it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Key point, function of a priest, whether it be the high priest that Jesus is, uh, according to the order of Melchizedek, or the Levitical one, all priests have to have something to offer. The function of priest, period, is to offer some sacrifice. So, no matter how far Jesus is different from the Levitical priest, it is nonetheless true that, as priest, he necessarily has an offering to make. What is that offering? I guess I can spoil it since we all know. Uh, it is the offering of his life on the cross, but we'll talk more about that as we move forward. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Jesus' offering does not fit in with the offerings prescribed by the law. It is an offering of a different sort, such that if you're just looking at the Levitical priests, it would be hard to call Jesus priest. His priesthood is something else, and his offering is something else. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. The tent, the temple in which the Jewish priesthood served, it was intended to be viewed as a sort of a copy, an image of heaven, given by instructions from God. So if you're serving in the copy, how does that compare to a priest who is serving in heaven proper? By, Jesus is not only better by virtue of the eternal nature of his priesthood, or by virtue of his law, but also by virtue of where it is that he serves. We're going through basically and systematically everything about what it means to be a priest and showing how Jesus is that and then some. So now his house is better than their house. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry which is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. The covenant is also better because it originates from an oath given by God rather than merely by the law made, given by God to Moses and ratifying the covenant between Moses, the people, and God. Uh, in the case of Jesus' priesthood, it is, a, it is a direct oath and promise from God, which is why it's eternal. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, the days will come, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I paid no heed to them, says the Lord. The old covenant was made and people still sinned. Whoops. The old covenant was imperfect. Uh, it did not have the ability to keep people from sinning, which is pretty obvious. Uh, the part of this issue that is more difficult is the part that says, because we as Christians believe we're, on the new, we're in the new and better covenant, 
does this covenant keep us from sinning? Not really. So what's the deal? Somehow, the difference then is not in whether or not we sin. Somehow there is a difference on the impact that sin has on our lives and the way we live. This is also a critical point when we're looking at how it is that Jesus is able to affect salvation for us. He cannot force us to stop sinning and allow us to keep free will. So what he has to do is he has to change the accounting or the consequences of our sin. Uh, we'll get into that also more as the study progresses. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow or everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Everybody will know God personally, not by the need to learn him, but by some, learn about him, but by some internal presence, awareness, knowledge of God that will become innate and inherent to all of us. And as a consequence of that, and what comes about because of that, I will remember their sins no more. Something is set to change in this new covenant about the fundamental nature of the relationship between God and humanity. There's going to be a major shift, um, which changes the way sins are accounted and changes the way people are able to relate with God. That is what the offering of Jesus Christ is able to accomplish. Although we still haven't gotten quite to the how, I think we have a pretty good idea by now of the what it is that he does. It's just not the how on earth can that possibly happen. We'll get there. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The reason we don't mandate circumcision, for example, in, as Christians, is that as this new covenant came about, the practices of the old have passed away. Uh, we've taken and we'll see the old covenant actually enables and allows the new one to come about. But once that has occurred, now we live under the law of the new covenant. And so the specific laws of the old covenant do not necessarily apply, which from time to time can be nice because, like many of us, I like bacon and shellfish. Um, but of course, it doesn't change the fact we have rules under which we live. It's just that they're not these hundreds of Old Testament precepts. It's much more broad and general law and rule, which we will also talk about as we move forward with this study. This has been a summary of Lesson 9 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The Letter to the Hebrews, an explanation of the mechanism of our salvation. For more information, consult our written study or visit our online forums at turningtogodsword.com.